Hello and welcome back to the Evolution of Medicine news video cast. I am your host, James Maskell. It is Saturday, the 20th of February, and I am back here in the studio with my friend and partner at the Evolution of Medicine, Gabe Hoffman. Welcome, Gabe. Hey, James. Good to be here. Good to see you and uh, be with you here. Uh, our, our news video broadcast this week is brought to you by HealthWave. They've been a sponsor of the Evolution of Medicine here for about a year. A lot of the most digitally savvy doctors in the community are using HealthWave to create a great user experience for their patients uh, around supplements. They have over 20,000 SKUs, 275 of the professional brands, and are getting better and better all the time. Check out goevomed.com slash HealthWave to open an account, try it with five patients, and I think you'll see the adherence in months th uh, two and three will really blow you away if you haven't tried it so far. So actually, we're going to start with supplements this week, Gabe, and one of the things that was sent in to us by um, a friend of the Evolution of Medicine was this article on Spiritam, which is the first 3D printed pill, uh, which was recently approved by the FDA. Now, I've heard from people smarter than me that the future of supplements is going to be individually printed prescriptions uh, of supplements, 3D printed uh, to, to meet people's individual needs. What do you think about, uh, about this topic, Gabe? Pretty incredible. I mean, and you can imagine printing out something that you ingest. Uh, this, to, for me, in almost like a science fiction type way, and, and I know this isn't brand new, people have been talking about it in, in recent years, but this is a real leap from being able to actually, uh, you know, to having to make something and manufacture it to creating something out of almost what feels like the atmosphere, you know, and, and the level of, you know, the level of customize, you know, what's the, what's the word, but being able to customize it on the fly. Uh, in, in this case, they talk about, they're talking about a pharmaceutical. They're talking about being able to make it the right, dose and size based on the child's weight and the ability to swallow the pill and just really getting to that level of specificity is, is exciting and really mind-blowing that this is, this is where we're headed. Yeah, it says the 3D printing option gives doctors the ability to change the individual dose of medicine for specific patients, taking into consideration their ages, sizes, medical conditions, and ability to swallow pills. You know, this is very interesting to me because, like, my wife is basically heart weighs half as much as I do. And so it says, oh, this is the adult dose. And I always, you know, wonder about that because, you see, well, like, I literally am twice the size um, in, in terms of mass. Um, so that's always uh, struck me as something, but here's, you know, a potential solution to that. Clearly, uh, it, it's not a one size fits all. I mean, we've been, but when you're selling things, especially in a store and, you know, they're just going to make one size and, and even, you know, the doctor is somewhat limited because he has, they have what they have on their shelves, if it's a nutraceutical or pharmaceutical and you got to work with what you have and to be able to print it out specifically and and again, printing it, it's just the concept of having an ability to not have to carry it, but just print it as needed will also change the economics of all this, won't it? Yeah, but it would definitely will, especially as the unit cost comes down. And, you know, this brings me to a greater point, which is, should practitioners make money from selling supplements? I mean, I've said on the show on the Functional Forum a couple of times before that I feel like the future of our industry is that practitioners are not making, sub making money selling supplements. I think it's stopping a lot of doctors coming into the industry because they see that, you know, they see Mark Hyman's website with supplements on it or whatever, and they think, well, I don't want to be a supplement salesperson, or they go to conferences and see like two 200 booths from different professional supplement companies they probably didn't even know existed. And um, I would just contend that, you know, the, the more that practitioners can have their value be based on their value and not on the supplements that they carry in their office, I think it's going to be, that's the future of the industry. That's a winning mentality. I think it's been good in the short term. It, it, I think it was necessary in the short term to get it to this level, but I, I definitely feel like in, in the future, once integrated medicine is part of the, you know, the standard of primary care, um, it's probably not going to be okay for doctors just to be selling supplements in their office. And that's why we've encouraged looking at models like direct primary care and other things where you know you're not selling supplements as the majority of your revenue because I just feel over time that's that's not going to be cool. Yeah, and and you know shout out to to Healthwave again the sponsor who are, you know they're going to be valuable regardless of what happens with supplements and even though they're their kind of platform they've been so focused on the uh, compliance and the adherence issue that they're 
they realize they're going to be valuable no matter what happens. Well, actually, when I heard the idea of 3D printed supplements as the future of supplements, uh, Kyle, who's the CEO of HealthWave, was actually standing right next to me when the person said it. So I know he's aware of that. But yeah, look, you know, what's necessary is technology is a really strong way to be able to improve compliance. We've talked about that through different podcasts. And um, yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to see this moving forward. And I look forward to taking my first 3D printed supplement when it's available. So um, that was an interesting topic. I think particularly interested to, you know, to uh, holistic providers who are listening to this podcast. The next thing was all over the news. Like when I pulled up Reddit uh, earlier this week, which is where I get a lot of my news from, um, that it was, this was literally taking up three of the top 25 slots on the front page. And Reddit calls itself the front page of the internet, the most exciting things that are happening. And this was this T-cell ca- cancer breakthrough. 94% of leukemia patients see symptoms vanish using cars modified therapy so it's essentially a um, you know a, a new strategy that's being being used with uh, removing immune cells called T cells from patients tagging them and then uh, infusing them back into the body you know Gabe I'd love to hear your uh, your thoughts on this this is not something that I know that much about and um, potentially you know a little bit more about it but I, I did see that it was almost everywhere this week well you know, when you read the whole article, there were some significant side effects for some of the people, uh, but it's it's a step in a in a direction. I guess you know when you think about, I personally had had a stem cell transplant, so that's where you know you took certain types of cells that I already had, froze them, and then down the road after going through some conventional treatments, received those stem cells back, and you know it was part of my journey. Uh, this seems like they're they're taking the cells and not just giving them right back to you. They're modifying them. So this probably will open up some conversations about modifying things, putting them back in the body. What are the positives? Are there going to be negatives? However, anytime you see a 94% impact on a cancer, this is big news. Uh, it's 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 a bit of a different approach. And and like you said, I mean, I would love to get feedback from doctors specifically about this article or, or from experts in the comments below because I would like to see some other ways to interpret this and some other opinions because I, you know, I'm really just giving you based on my personal experience and what it feels like so far. Yeah, well, we'd love to engage the community. We appreciate you sending us news stories to news at GoEvoMed, but we also appreciate your comments um, below. Um, Yeah, you know, this is interesting. Obviously, I think that most of us in the integrated medicine community see the solution to cancer as really, you know, getting on top of the lifestyle side of it. You know, part of it is obviously genetic. Part of it is lifestyle. Probably the majority is lifestyle. I think I've seen recently that, you know, um, uh, obesity is a real driving force of cancer and there's a lot of reasons why cancer is growing toxicity so forth sugar like changes in diet and all that kind of stuff so i think you know uh, alternative providers and integrated medicine typically sees that as our solution like let's really get good at doing integrated medicine behavior change and so forth and we'll be able to really you know create real solutions for cancer obviously mainstream cancer is looking more in this kind of direction for like miracle cures that make it go away and uh, I'd also be interested to hear everyone's thoughts on, um, you know, that sort of debate because, uh, you know, I, I think that that's an interesting part of, of, um, of cancer care. Absolutely. Yeah. So we can't go much further this week or anywhere without talking about Zika. Obviously, that was our main story last week where we were talking about the fact that uh, here's the Zika virus. Does it call, cause the microcephaly? Doesn't it cause it? And we found two articles here that I thought were, were pretty interesting, especially if you put them side by side. So, um, you know, the first thing here is... Uh, Zika hysteria is way ahead of research into virus, expert says. So this is from The Guardian. Uh, It's unclear whether birth defects in Brazil are linked to Zika, and any panic can cause more harm than the virus itself. So I thought this was uh, very interesting, um, Gabe. And, you know, on one hand, you've got, you know, someone saying here, we don't really know what's causing the microcephalies. Um, The government is convinced there's a causal association. The World Health Organization has declared a global health emergency. Uh, But many scientists are saying the evidence is not conclusive. And so you've got like a lot of panic. There's serious panic going on. I mean, in the US, people being panicking about going to Florida. There's, you know, Zika in Texas. So there's certainly a lot of of panic going on. And we've had we've had this panic a number of times over the last SARS and bird flu. I'm sure we all remember those kind of things. Well, and then, then, as you know, last week, 
uh, the idea was that this is leading to the, the microcephalies and we, we taught everyone how to pronounce that word. And the, uh, but what we found last week were articles that talked about uh, GMO mosquitoes and also the, the uh, insecticides that were being put in the water and that there were, there were scientists in Argentina and, uh, Argentina and, Bra and Brazil or was it Brazil? I, there were scientists yeah, though, in, yeah. yeah, where they felt that it could be very much related to those insecticides and that the timing was exactly like that. And that in Colombia, there were 4,000 cases of Zika in pregnant women that did not lead to microcephalies. Yeah, I've also seen stuff about the DTaP vaccine that was mandated at 22 weeks. And then, you know, if you look at the birth cycle of the kids who are all having the microcephalies, you know, could have been in line with that. And, you know, if you look at toxins, to me, are a much more likely cause of microcephalies because remember thalidomide, remember Agent Orange, like look at the kids in Vietnam who have Agent Orange, you know, that are direct descendants of people that were sprayed with Agent Orange, they have microcephalies. To me, I've never heard of a virus cause a microcephaly. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I have, I have heard of toxins causing, I've seen pictures of it and it's proven. So, you know, I think that there's a lot more than meets the eye. As we said last week, our own genetics and mosquitoes don't have very good lawyers or PR teams. Um, so that's interesting. And then on the other side of this article, we've got in the Washington Post, them saying that, um, you know, that we shouldn't, we're not scared enough about the Zika virus. Um, what we, what's really scary are the things that we don't know. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the hysteria that only the American media can, can cause. Um, so what, what are your thoughts well, on this well, game? If you, as you scroll down through the article, right? So it's going to give you, here are the reasons you're not worried enough, right? So let's, let's move through them a little bit. Because I, I think it's interesting. Because last week, it was really the news very much saying the microcephalies is, is coming from these mosquitoes. Now, what they're saying is, we don't know whether there is a link. The first thing right here, we don't know whether there is a link between Zika and microcephaly. And it's being framed as bad news. But I would say in the context of last week where they said it was, this might be good news, a new update, right? Yeah. It's, we're not certain that it's coming from that. But in the context of this article, this is now bad news because it could be related to microcephaly, which is less than what they were saying last week. It might, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, exactly. So um, they've seen a huge surge considering they reported 147 in, in last year. Now they've got about 4,000 cases of the microcephaly. We strongly believe that cases of microcephaly are identified uh, due to the Zika virus, as we said last week. You know, um, you know obviously there's, there's a lot of Zika virus in pregnant women in Colombia, no microcephalies. So, you know, it's an interesting topic, but I think, you know, the fear you move through. So if you, so if you keep moving through here, it's, it's like, we don't know if there's a link between Zika and other health issues. And you go down further, we don't know how Zika can be transmitted. Um, are we getting more of it? And then uh, let's see what the, the next one. And so some of this talks about, can it be sexually transmitted? And, and because of the fact that in some people, you don't feel the symptoms at all. Maybe we don't know how many people have Zika virus. It just seems, it feels like this list and how to end this outbreak and it gets right into vaccines. But it's like this list is all based on how much we know for a fact that Zika virus are causing these horrible things. Because if it's not, it's, it's, it's annoying and it's something that seems to be giving people flu-like symptoms and a rash. But if it's not giving you microcephalies and it's not causing these other things, you don't necessarily have to be so scared of this one specific virus. The bigger issues still are the chronic issues, the lifestyle, the fact that people aren't taking care of themselves. I mean, people are pretty much putting themselves into a health crisis on their own without any help from mosquitoes or otherwise. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a fan of mosquitoes in any way. And I've, all, I've often thought to myself, they seem to be one part of the food chain that doesn't really add any value. And I've heard some people say in the past that, like, you know, they're probably not even necessary because not many things eat them. But, uh, you know, some of these plans, like genetically altered mosquitoes, uh, doesn't seem like a, a good idea to me at this point. But, killing you know, them all together. It would seem killing anything altogether that has been here 
you, someone always ends up figuring out that that was a mistake, right? Yeah, these are negative externalities of every action that you take. So uh, I think it's a, it's an interesting topic. Look, we'd love to know your thoughts about it. There's a lot of good news coming out. You know, we had some um, great feedback on the news last week with people sharing articles that they'd seen about it. That's how I found out about the DTAP. Uh, part of things and, and some conclusion around that. I haven't seen that coming out, but yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts. And this is really, you know, the point of why we're doing the news is to, you know, is to uh, share what we think is important. And um, you know, very excited to, you know, to be seeing these kind of stories come up, uh, so that you know we can break them down in a different way and sort of get underneath what's really going on. Health, health news is action packed, man, every week. <laughs> and, and, you know, just to get back to the, to the article, the other Zika article that we were looking at, uh, it's, it's saying, what are the, what's the downside of causing hysteria? And I, and I, that's what we're getting at. No one wants there to be a virus that's causing microcephaly. And I'm certainly not saying let's ignore it, but there are, there are impacts no matter what we do. So, we have to start to think about what is the greater impact and do people benefit from hysteria? Because it does seem like the media is constantly generating hysteria through numerous different techniques and approaches. And it's an understatement when I say that, but still it's worth pointing out that if you have an opportunity to comfort people or you have an opportunity to scare them, it seems like they like to twist the knife a little bit, James. Well, that's what sells newspapers and gets ratings and all those kind of things. I mean, that's no secret. So it's kind of interesting us being in the news game now, bringing all this news because, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting to a certain degree. But um, I think uh, calming down is, is probably, probably good, strong advice at this point. I agree. So, uh, yeah, interesting week in the news. Thanks so much, everyone, for your uh, feedback. We love getting uh, articles. You can sell them, send them to news at GoEvoMed. We are back each and every week with a wrap-up of the news on Saturday. Um, this week's news has been brought to you by HealthWave. We mentioned them earlier. If you go to GoEvoMed.com slash HealthWave, set up an account, try it with five patients, monitor what happens to those patients in months two and three. I think you'll see that you'll see a significant uptick in adherence. And um, HealthWave is a technology that is going places, and we're excited to have them as a sponsor on the show. Uh, I'm your host, James Maskell. I've been here with Gabe Hoffman. We will have some new, exciting, special guests coming up soon. We'll be at the Integrated Health Symposium this week in New York. Hope to see you if you're there. If not, we'll see you next week on the news and on the forum with Dr. Jeffrey Bland on 229. That is coming up on Monday, uh, the 29th of uh, February, coming up soon. But uh, from Gabe and I, uh, it's been great being with you and we'll see you next time.